What do you think about when someone says a normal source of power? Let's think about a typical commercial building. Where does the power come from that enters the building? It's common that normal power comes from a utility company and is stepped down through transformers either outside or inside of the building. The distributed power through the facility is typically three phase 480 or 208 volts. Three phase loads include large motors like HVAC units, chillers, and pumps. There would also be single phase loads at 277 or 120 volts connected phase to neutral to feed lights, receptacles, communication systems, and smaller pumps and fans. When we think of that typical commercial building, it doesn't seem like too big of a deal if they lost power. While it might be a short-term annoyance, as long as elevators can let people out and exit signs and emergency lighting can turn on, then people can leave the building and be safe. This is where healthcare facilities, and more specifically hospitals, are very different from a typical commercial building. Patients, and the doctors, nurses, and administrators taking care of them, can't necessarily leave when something happens to the utility feed since their life and well-being may rely on the equipment in the hospital. In a hospital environment, the term that defines maintaining the facility in the face of adversity and external forces is defend in place. There is this defend in place type of methodology. It's not like another public occupancy where should something go wrong, should there be a fire, uh, should there be other some kind of disaster that you quickly evacuate the, the space? It is a defend in place because many of the occupants are not able to be quickly moved, uh, whether they're connected to some type of life short, uh, support equipment or they might just be unable uh, to, to, to be moved quickly from the facility. So it's a different type of mindset when you're talking about the performance requirements and the installation requirements for that type of occupancy class. Since there is significant risk and requirements for hospitals, they can't rely on one normal source of power from the utility to keep things up and running. Today, utility power is very dependable and may only be lost a few times a year due to uncontrollable events like storms, accidental animal contact, and equipment failure, but that's not good enough for a hospital since some equipment can't lose power for even a fraction of a second. To simplify this concept, consider this graphic showing that the normal availability of a utility power system is 99.9% .9 or three nines of availability, and while that seems very good, it equates to about nine hours of downtime every year. In our homes, this is probably acceptable, but this is nowhere near acceptable for a hospital. 99.99% .99 available, or four nines is better, but for critical electronic loads, UPSs and additional redundancy may be needed to get to five or even six nines of availability. In some situations, power may need to be removed from the building for contractors to perform maintenance or upgrades to an electrical system, but these will be considered planned outages. There's a major difference between planned and unplanned outages when it comes to downtime and cost. Still, with proper preparation, a planned outage is much easier to deal with than an unplanned outage. The complexity, size, and criticality of a hospital and the electrical safety codes dictate the requirements for alternate power sources such as generators, battery backup systems, and alternate utility feeds. Before we discuss the different types of power systems in hospitals, let's think about the loads and their criticality so that we can understand which loads need to be protected and to what extent. In a very simplistic way, we can categorize loads by the feeder branches that supply power to these loads the equipment branch, critical branch, and the life safety branch. So what is the importance of these three branches that feed the electrical loads in hospitals? Let's start with the equipment branch. The equipment branch is a system of feeders and branch circuits arranged for delayed, automatic, or manual connection to the alternate power source and that serves primarily three-phase power equipment. These loads include the mechanical loads required for the clinical activities, which typically consist of large three-phase equipment such as motors, compressors, pumps, and fans. The concern with separating these loads from other loads is that they create large inrush currents during startup and may be disruptive to other loads. Next, the critical branch in a hospital is a system of feeders and branch circuits supplying power for the task illumination, fixed equipment, select receptacles, and select power circuits serving areas and functions related to patient care that are automatically connected to the alternate power sources by one or more transfer switches during interruptions of the normal power source. 
The critical branch is intended to serve a limited number of loads that either have immediate impact on the well-being of patients or are essential to the clinical functionality of the healthcare facility. Examples of these locations would be operating rooms, nurseries, medication preparation and pharmacy, communication systems, and additional specialized patient care areas. Finally, the life safety branch in a hospital is a system of feeders and branch circuits supplying power for lighting, receptacles, and equipment essential for life safety that is automatically connected to the alternate power sources by one or more transfer switches during interruption of the normal power source. The life safety branch is generally given the highest priority. It spans egress lighting, exit signs and exit directional signs, communication systems, generator set locations, elevator cab lighting, control and communications, electrically powered doors used for egress, fire alarms, and auxiliary functions of the fire alarm systems. As a contractor, you will hear a lot about these different feeder branches that we have just discussed. But you will also need to know about and understand the different patient care spaces within a healthcare facility. These spaces or areas are separated into four categories. Category one includes the space in which failure of equipment or a system is likely to cause major injury or death to patients, staff, or visitors. Category two is a space in which failure of equipment or a system is likely to cause minor injury to patients, staff, or visitors. Category three is a space in which failure of equipment or a system is not likely to cause injury to the patient, staff, or visitors, but can cause patient discomfort. Finally, category four includes the space where failure of equipment or a system is not likely to have a physical impact on patient care. What makes a hospital's normal power source differ from most commercial buildings is the number of utility feeds that are connected to the power system. Typical commercial buildings will have a single utility feed, but hospitals will generally have multiple feeds. Not only do they have multiple feeds, but they are totally separate feeds coming from different substations, usually on separate utility poles, so that if one feeder goes out, more than likely the other will still have power. As a contractor, this is important to recognize because this adds to the complexity of the overall power system. It's very important to make sure that when you turn something off and lock it out, that a backup source doesn't come on and apply power to the same location. In addition, many systems will have UPS power or battery backup, so it is important to realize that power may be on the equipment even if you locked out the main source of power. Most of the work inside hospital substations will be done by their own personnel, including switching, but you still need to know how the system is designed since power can be coming from upstream and or downstream when generators and backup power systems are installed. From a power quality and safety standpoint, hospitals use a lot of isolation or one-to-one -one transformers with an electrostatic shield to minimize electrical noise. In addition, you will likely come across orange and red receptacles in hospitals. The orange plugs are intended to isolate the ground wire with an insulated conductor from the service panel to the receptacle to protect from electrical noise and interference. You have to pay special attention when installing these receptacles. The red receptacles indicate that the power feeding them is backed up through the emergency power supply. The Essential Electrical System, or EES, is defined in NFPA as a system comprised of alternate sources of power and all connected distribution systems and ancillary equipment designed to ensure continuity of electrical power to designated areas and functions of a healthcare facility during disruption of normal power sources and also to minimize disruption within the internal wiring system. The EES for hospitals consists of separate branches to allow sequential transfer of power from the normal sources to an alternate source for blocks of loads and order of priority and critical nature of the loads. We'll work with a light company if we're taking one of the services down into a building, uh, into a hospital, and you may have three sources of power from the utility into that building. When we're taking one of them down, we bring in the, the light company, the power company, just to say, hey, we're going to be taking this service down. We just want to verify with you. You don't have schedule outages. You're not working on that line so we don't lose the second or third source of power into the building. The key point to an electrician in the hospital is looking as far into the future as you can. Uh, if you're working on a life safety system, you need to look everywhere down line of that system and even upstream of it. If, if the worst thing that actually could have gone wrong actually did go wrong, 
what is going to be the possible outcome of that and how can we avoid anything coming out of that that would possibly be a danger to somebody's life. The life safety in critical branches must be kept independent of all other wiring and equipment. The wiring of the life safety in critical branches must be mechanically protected by raceways as defined in the NEC, for example, fiberglass or PVC conduit buried in concrete. The life safety and critical branch loads must be installed and connected to the alternate source of power in a manner that power is automatically restored to these loads within 10 seconds of power interruption. If you were a contractor new to the healthcare environment and a healthcare facility, some things that you might notice that are unique would be different color outlets. Some fed from a normal source, some fed from an emergency or a backup source. Uh, if you were looking in an operating room, you might see isolated power systems that actually isolate the power from ground using a, a transformer. Um, these are some of the unique things that you would find in a healthcare facility that you could easily see that makes that infrastructure unique and different. The equipment branch loads must be installed and connected to the alternate source of power at appropriate time lag intervals after power interruption via delayed automatic or manual connection as prescribed by code. So NFPA 99 is what we call a risk-based document. So it, it establishes based on risk to the patient or staff that are in a given area, the type of systems and electrical infrastructure that has to be installed in that, in that space of the facility. So the essential electrical system is a requirement for any area or space that, where there would be a large risk uh, of serious injury or even death should that system fail. So the NFPA 99 defines those spaces and the electrical infrastructure known as the essential electrical system that has to feed those. It also defines how that system has to be broken into individual branches and what types of loads are allowed to be on each one of the branches, the life safety branch, the critical bank branch, and the equipment branch of that essential electrical system. The Emergency Power Supply System, or EPSS, is included within the EES except for the Equipment Branch, Critical Branch, and Life Safety Branch loads. The EPSS is a complete functioning emergency power supply, or EPS, coupled to a system of conductors, disconnecting means, and overcurrent protective devices, transfer switches, and all control, supervisory, and support devices up to and including the load terminals of the transfer equipment needed for the system to operate as a safe and reliable source of electric power. Hospitals utilize transfer switches to quickly and safely transition all electrical power consumed by the circuit, equipment, or systems connected to the transfer switch output between those normal and emergency power sources. All electrical power consumed by the circuit, equipment, or system connected to the transfer switch output is defined as a load. A typical transfer sequence includes these steps. One, the normal power source fails. Two, when power from the generator or the backup utility feed is stable and within prescribed voltage and frequency tolerances, the transfer switch shifts the electrical load to the emergency power source. Depending on the facility's needs and preferences, that transfer occurs either automatically or is executed manually. And three, when utility power is restored, the transfer switch returns the load from the emergency power source to the normal one after a short appropriate delay. Again, this can happen automatically or manually, depending on the type of switch being used and its operation mode. Closed transition switch gear and transfer equipment provides momentary overlap of power sources which eliminate power interruptions when returning to the normal power source. If the electrical demand exceeds the capacity of a single generator, the hospital needs to use active generator control to connect the generators together and to connect the generator or groups of generators to the utility. A bypass isolation transfer switch is frequently selected for use in healthcare because it provides increased reliability through redundancy and allows the primary switching mechanism to be isolated from the power source to facilitate regular maintenance, inspection, and testing as required by code such as NFPA 110. The emergency power supply, or EPS, is the source of electric power of the required capacity and quality for an emergency power supply system in healthcare applications. Simply stated, the EPS usually just includes the generator backup power source. So what is considered an alternate power source? According to the NFPA, an alternate power source is one or more generator sets or battery systems where permitted, intended to provide power during the interruption of the normal electrical service, 
or the public utility electrical service intended to provide power during interruption of service normally provided by the generating facilities on the premises. A generator specification most often depends on the size of hospital or facility, location, and ease of access to particular fuel types and suppliers. Due to capacity, most hospitals typically employ diesel or gasoline generators. It is also common to see generator quick connect switchboards used in tandem with temporary generators that also run on gasoline. The other alternative for generators is the turbine generator, typically powered by natural gas. Gas turbine generator sets are generally lighter in weight than diesel engine generator sets, run more quietly, and generally require less cooling and combustion air, leading to lower installation costs. However, gas turbine generator sets are more expensive than diesel engine generator sets and require more starting time, normally around 30 seconds compared to the 10 to 15 seconds for diesels. Generator circuits have unique characteristics that require specially designed and tested circuit breakers. Circuit breakers intended for generator protection must comply with IEEE standards through testing that the generator circuit breaker can switch under specified out-of-phase conditions. Today, you may also hear the term microgrids when you hear about EPS or EES. Microgrids allow the hospital to optimize loads and sources while still maintaining the reliability and safety required by codes and standards. Microgrids may also include other sources such as solar, wind, or energy storage that supplement the system but are not relied upon as the EPS. During power outages and for the 10 seconds or so that power is not available during the generator starting and transfer period, UPSs or uninterruptible power supplies are required to supply power to sensitive electronic loads. Most life support equipment in hospitals have dedicated UPSs built into the equipment. In addition to the ride-through benefit during the transition to the generator, the UPS can provide valuable time to troubleshoot and maintain continuity if the generator doesn't properly start or transfer. A simple diagram of a traditional double conversion UPS shows you how they work. AC power is converted to DC power through a rectifier circuit connected to the DC bus. During normal operation, the power is then converted from DC back to AC through an inverter to feed the loads. On the DC bus, some form of energy storage, like a battery, is used in case the AC source on the rectifier side is lost. Variations of sophistication within individual UPS units and multiple UPS units that make up a system allows hospitals to have a redundancy within UPS units and these systems. UPSs use batteries, flywheels, supercapacitors, or some other form of storage to supply power through electronics to the loads during power disruption. These options vary in cost, backup time, and required maintenance. UPSs are generally used for seconds or minutes, while generators are used for minutes, hours, or even days to back up a hospital power system. UPS systems do not alleviate the need for a generator or second utility service power source but they do serve to buffer critical loads from the effects of generator starting time and voltage and frequency variations. As a contractor, you may work alongside hospital facility personnel or UPS technicians to do work on or around UPS systems. The critical things to remember include the presence of DC sources of power even if the UPS is off, alternate paths of power during maintenance or component failure, and the expected runtime that the UPS can operate on its energy storage. In addition, recognize that the recharge time on traditional lead-acid batteries could be 10 to 100 times the discharge rate to fully recharge the batteries. Traditionally, UPSs use lead-acid batteries including either wet cells that require a lot of maintenance but could last 20 years or more, or valve-regulated lead-acid or VRLA batteries that may only last 5 years. Knowing this, and the criticality of these systems, maintenance and evaluation of these battery systems are very important for hospital applications. Today, other types of batteries like lithium ion are quickly becoming the standard for UPSs and hospital applications because they can withstand many more charge discharge cycles. Working on and around lithium ion batteries requires you to understand additional safety precautions. Although it is relatively easy to understand how a thermomagnetic low voltage breaker works for overcurrents and fault protection, power circuit breakers and switch gear require an additional piece of equipment called a trip unit for low voltage breakers and a protective relay for medium voltage breakers. Today, these devices are sophisticated electronic brains that can go on these breakers for protection and monitoring. 
For medium voltage applications, protective relays were developed more than 100 years ago to simply provide a trip signal for a medium voltage power circuit breaker during a fault or abnormal condition. Many hospitals with aging electrical systems continue to use vintage electromechanical relays which rely on coils operating on moving discs to provide detection of abnormal operating conditions. However, as hospitals' essential electrical systems evolve to accommodate larger loads, these old mechanical relays are being replaced by modern electronic relays that have significantly more protective and monitoring capabilities. On low voltage power circuit breakers and some more advanced molded case circuit breakers, the electronic brains or trip units have very advanced programmable monitoring and protective functions. This allows protective settings like arc flash reduction maintenance mode and much more sophisticated system coordination capabilities. As a contractor working in hospitals, you should be aware of these more advanced capabilities, settings, and risks associated with adjustments to these settings. Selective coordination is understanding how your overcurrent protective devices respond to a current that passes through them in that series circuit. You want to make sure that the downstream device opens, the upstream device doesn't. Now, in Article 700, 701, 708, other emergency systems, we require you to selectively coordinate at the three-phase bolt default. In a healthcare environment, what the National Electrical Code has done and what NFPA 99 has done is said, look, we're going to leave that up to the designer. They created a bare minimum requirement that leaves flexibility to the designer, but it's important that the designer understands that these overcurrent devices respond to current and they need to be evaluated against the amount of current that's going to flow through the series circuit. And that's, that's an important for obvious reliability reasons. The coordination study, in my opinion, for the hospital work is the most important. Those settings have to be derived from an engineer by cable length, size of cable, type of conduit around the cable. Th those are all important things. But that, from our standpoint, we give that information to the electrical engineer, and then he calculates that for the breaker settings. If the coordination study's off, you could have nuisance tripping, uh, life safety issues. There's a lot that can go wrong if a coordination study is not done correctly. Similar to the advancements in mechanical relays, low voltage trip units that used to require a small screwdriver to adjust the settings now can be adjusted through a computer or a local digital display. It's important for you as a contractor to understand the complexity of these devices, especially if you are upgrading from an older device to these modern electronic ones. For engineers, contractors, and maintenance personnel who are looking for ways to improve both safety and efficiency of electrical equipment, HMI dashboards and displays on the trip units and digital relays can provide many benefits by displaying real-time information for you to safely see for troubleshooting or maintenance issues. Other advanced controls in hospitals that contractors should be aware of include automatic transfer schemes and control schemes. In most systems, it is not uncommon to have two levels of automatic transfer between utility feeds. The first at the medium voltage service entrance equipment and the second at the low voltage switch gear downstream. Coordination and when automatic transfer should occur at each level is critical. In general, transfers should occur at the furthest upstream equipment first and the transfer between the utility feeds is coordinated to act faster than the transfer to the backup generators. This capability is vital because it prevents disruptions to healthcare systems to minimize disruption in patient care. Generator paralleling switchgear and transfer equipment is used to provide a momentary overlap of power sources by paralleling those sources to eliminate power interruptions when returning to the normal source. In addition, paralleling switchgear is required if multiple generators are needed from a capacity standpoint to supply power to the loads in a hospital. With microprocessor-based controls, generator paralleling switchgear can respond to load changes, react to a wide variety of conditions, and work with the UPS, saving time and improving system reliability during an emergency. Because of synchronization requirements, generator paralleling switchgear is a more sophisticated but capable system and can provide hospitals with high reliability. As a contractor, it is important to understand the differences between a traditional open transition transfer switch and paralleling switchgear. Finally, contractors should be aware that information available through a real-time electrical power management system or an EPMS can provide the central intelligence needed to drive improvements in power reliability, energy efficiency, maintenance practices, and safety. Based on historical electrical generation and distribution data and reporting, 
facility managers can more effectively allocate where and when proactive maintenance dollars should be spent. Additionally, these systems can prove beneficial for event analysis. If a full power outage occurs, the ability to trace the events that led to the failure is key in protecting against liabilities. When regular event analysis is integrated with proactive maintenance, problematic equipment can be identified well before it fails. There is a lot to learn about the electrical system in a hospital that makes it different than other power systems and equipment you may have worked on in the past. If you want to learn more about the equipment that make up these systems, contact us or your local Eaton representative to schedule a visit to the Power Systems Experience Center today.